Welcome back. So now that we've looked at the structure of the metallic bonding model in terms of how the cations are arranged and the delocalized electrons, we're going to look at how we explain the properties we observe in metals and link this back to the model. The other thing that we're going to look at is limitations of the model in terms of the properties that it doesn't really explain. These kinds of points you'll see in exam questions that give you um, an explain command term, so they ask you to explain the properties of a particular thing, or they ask you to compare and contrast. So let's get started. When it comes to metals, the first one of the first things that we think about with metals are them being able to conduct electricity. We know that we use copper wires um, and various things like that that we use in order to conduct electricity. So this is critical that we get the terminology right. When an electric field is applied to a metal, one end becomes positive and the other becomes negative. So if we were to apply electrodes across here and make it part of a circuit, what's going to happen is one end becomes positive and one end becomes negative. The delocalized electrons are then free to move. What happens is they align in the direction and they will move towards the positive end remembering that negative charges are attracted to positive charges so they align themselves with the current and are drawn from the negative to the positive end so negative being anode remember anions are negative and cathode cations are positive so in this case our anode is going to be negative and a cathode is going to be positive if these were plugged in to complete a circuit. The electrons will align themselves with this current and they will move carrying that electrical charge through the wire which we refer to as an electric current. This occurs with all things that conduct electricity. So if you think of this as an old incandescent light bulb and in those light bulbs, this array here, we have a piece of metal that comes up from where the electricity comes in to the socket and a piece of wire that goes across here that was made of tungsten. So what happens is the electrical current flows up here fl through this wire and then back down. If the light bulb blew, this wire would break and the current could no longer be carried because we had no delocalized electrons moving through that wire. Same thing occurs when we connect the metal parts of a plug into the power socket that completes the circuit. Those metal plug points are conductive and it carries the charge from inside the socket, so where the live wires are, down through into the power cable and charges your device. The other thing that metals can do are conduct heat. Okay, so if we apply heat, so say a Bunsen burner, it's going to be providing energy into the system. We know as if we provide energy into a system, we increase movement. So what starts to happen is the atoms within the metal start to become energized and vibration increases. Because they're so tightly packed together, those vibrations are very quickly transferred into the molecule the atoms that are sitting beside them. The electrons start to move more, we just increase the energy of the system. So because they're ordered and tightly packed, that vibration is passed quickly through and along the metal, transferring the heat. Malleability and ductility. When you're answering questions about these, and it might say, explain three properties of metals according to the metallic bonding model, it's a good idea to treat malleability and ductility as one. The reasoning is going to be the same. So generally when you're being asked questions like that for assessment, they want you to be thinking of different types of explanations, not giving the same explanation for two properties. So we tend to look at these two together. So malleable being able to be hammered and bent into shapes and ductile being drawn out into a wire. These occur because of the nature of the strength of the bonds in the metallic lattice. The metal becomes thinner, but the nature of the bonding does not change. That is because no matter how much we thin out the layers of the lattice, it's still going to be stabilized by that delocalized sea of electrons. We've still got a strong electrostatic attraction. 
So the attractive forces exerted by the positive metal ions for the mobile electrons occur in all directions, so it keeps the bond stable even when we bend it out or put it as thin as a wire. So when the metal is beaten into sheets, drawn into wires, the layers of cations can move over each other without disrupting the attractive force, so we don't tend to see breaks and it maintains its integrity. In terms of lustrous, this one is sometimes a little bit hard to explain and the model doesn't explain this particularly well. But generally the lustrous appearance of a metal is due to delocalized mobile electrons reflecting light. So as the light comes in, it's likely to hit an electron and it gets bounced back out. So the reflected light is what we perceive as the shininess of the metal surface when that light is reflected back into our eye when we're looking at it. Sometimes metals won't appear to be lustrous. This is usually because they formed an oxide layer on the outside, so a crusty layer. Sometimes you might have seen it on a railing outside. On aluminium it's sort of white and fluffy. Of course with iron it's going to be brown and look like and be rust, so that orangey brown color. Even the green coating on top of Flinders Street Station, that green oxide layer is actually on a layer of copper, which at one point would have looked bright and shiny and orange like this one here. So that corrosion is preventing us from seeing the lustrousness of the metal underneath. In terms of relating to the hardness of metals, the density of metals and their melting points, all of these are related back to the strength of the metallic bond. So because they have high melting points and hardness, hardness being the ability to scratch, okay, so diamond being one of the, the hardest um, things that we know. If something is hard, it can cause a scratch in something that's softer. High melting points means a large amount of energy being required to disrupt the lattice and turn it into a liquid. So this means that our metallic bond is strong. The electrostatic attraction between the electrons and the cations is incredibly strong. So these tend to increase with the increase of number of outer shell electrons. So if I have a plus three charge, like an aluminium, it's going to have a stronger metallic bond than a plus one charge on sodium. The other thing that affects this is atomic radius. If my atom my cation is larger that charge is spread over a larger area so it's not going to be as strong overall okay and then with high density this is essentially if we remember that density is equal to mass divided by volume when we talk about density because the lattices are closely packed okay and ordered this gives the metals a high mass to volume ratio so they were typically dense materials Crystalline structures are something that we're going to look in our prac tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to grow some metal crystals. But even though we often see metals as sheets and we can't see the crystalline structure, when metals form in nature or we extract them in a lab, we can see the crystalline nature of them. And this occurs because of the organized lattice structure. Things that have a lattice structure will form crystals. And we know, talking about the three-dimensional array, that that ordered structure exists in metals. So we tend to see some pretty amazing crystalline structures. This one here is beryllium and then chromium crystals here. So these are generally used to plate um, chrome on ca old cars, things like that. And even titanium, we consider it a very strong metal, but titanium also forms crystalline structures. We will be in the lab in our experiment growing silver crystals and lead crystals and some copper crystals to have a look at how they differ in shape. And these different crystalline shapes occur because of the different organizations of the lattices and the shards of the atoms. But because we know the metallic bonding model tells us that it's an organized array with a highly ordered lattice structure, this explains the ordered crystalline structures that we see of metals. So one of the things that the model doesn't explain is the fact that we have some properties that we can't account for. It's very rare for a model in science to 
cover all situations. It's a best fit scenario where the observations that we have match the theoretical model without too many exceptions, and those exceptions are usually able to be explained in a different way. With the delocalized C model or the metallic bonding model that we look at, there are a number of things that do not coincide with that model, are not explained well by the model. And this is the range of melting temperatures and densities that we see of metals. So some metals are actually very light or they have low melting points. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Gallium's melting point is 36 degrees. So even though they have the same type of bonding, metallic bonding that we know to be strong, these tend to be exceptions to that high density high melting point kind of rule. So the, the model that we use, because it's consistent for all of them, doesn't tend to really explain these variations. The other thing that it doesn't do is explain how some metals are magnetic and some are not. That requires a different aspect of atomic structure to explain that we don't look at within the scope of this course. But the metallic bonding model as we know it doesn't explain these properties nor does it explain the differences we observe in electrical conductivity between metals, where some metals such as copper and silver are very good conductors and others not so much. So that's basically covering all of the properties that we need to know, linking them back to the structure. You should remember when you're um, trying to do questions in these areas, using an annotated diagram and then relating your answer back to that can often be a good way to approach these questions. The questions now that you should be able to approach in order to do these to consolidate this are given on page 59 and 62 of your textbook. You should have an annotated diagram of your metallic bonding model, remembering that without annotations it's not telling us anything. We should refer to the three-dimensional nature of the lattice when we put our annotations in our delocalized C and make note of the properties that aren't covered by this model and I'll see you in class.